Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode. I'm very excited to have my good friend, Chloe Mistoggy, joining me today. Chloe and I met through Bug Crowd while I was an ambassador there. She was running the ambassador program, working with ambassadors, and I was fortunate enough to get to meet her and some other folks from, from Bug Crowd. And so uh, we did a podcast together, The Uncommon Journey, and she's done a couple podcasts. And if you haven't heard of her, you know, you, you, you look out there, do your research. She's a very busy person, does a lot of speaking at conferences, does a lot for the industry and, and really trying to bring awareness to inclusiveness because uh, a lot of cases, this is something that's been overlooked or maybe really not uh, dealt with seriously enough. She's done a lot of things around hacker rights to help uh, security researchers and bug bounty hunters. So she does a lot of uh, good stuff and, and I thought she'd be a great guest to have on. I've been on her most recent podcast and so it's good to have her joining me today. Well, thanks for, Phil, thanks it's for great to be here. I should have done <laughs> jinx now. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, what's what? How are things going in your world? How's the new podcast going? Oh, it's going. I think uh, it's really interesting because the previous one, the Change Making podcast with ITSP Magazine, it focused on the you know the change makers in our space, those that are trying to make a difference and change things. And one thing that I really loved was hearing from different nonprofits. I would have them as guests so people can learn about nonprofits that exist in our industry. So if anyone felt like they were isolated or alone and they didn't know anyone who like looked like them or were like them, um, there were all these groups that I would have joined so anyone can you know, get to know other uh, nonprofits and also groups that are were trying to bring people in and support them, provide them with resources. But then this one is a little different because one of the things I always notice is like, if you really want change to occur in an industry, you kind of have to get the people at the top to get on board with everything. And what I mean is like, there is this trickle down effect, which is like when we, when we work on our leadership, when we work on becoming a better person ourselves, that does make an impact on the people around us, especially the people that we work with. And so that's when Secure Your Strategy came about for ITSP Magazine was a way to get people that are executives and leadership and security to be on board with all these different various things to make things more inclusive, but also to make it more sustainable on their security team, such as like making sure security team wellness is happening, that they have proper strategies in place for incident response how to be a good leader. These are all questions that we always dive into whenever I have a new guest on. It's great the things you're doing for the uh, being more inclusive and diversity because a lot of companies practice it, but I sometimes don't think they always do it the most effective way. I would agree. Um, I was on a podcast uh, relatively recently and in there, uh, we were talking about like, why aren't people staying on security teams? Why are they leaving? And every time that he was mentioning a management role, he would always use like he or him as if it was the go-to uh, term to use for a, like a leader. So instead of saying like, for example, you know, CISOs in general, they tend to do the following, right? He was saying, yeah, I think he needs to do the following. You know, a lot of men out there need to learn these kind of things. And I'm like, wow, what do you do in these moments? Do I do I just point it out on like how that is, that's already how you know you have a bias that you have to work on um, because you can't just assume that people in leadership are men. That's That's a bias that, you know, he is carrying and is now, still pushing it out there without knowing. I think it was unconscious, to be honest. I don't think it was something he actually was aware he was doing. Yeah, and then, well, you can't help but think too, is, is you know, everyone, you, you visualize the person you want in this role. And if you're visualizing a male, then it's gonna be hard for, for, for women. It's really funny that they don't at least say he or she, 
at least. But one of the things I adopted while I was teaching my class at Dallas College is I'd use gender neutral pronouns. It's just easier to mm -hmm. say they will instead of he or she. And it's just that way you're not really saying one before the other. You're just using something generic and and, you know, and then you got to, you know, consider the folks that are non-binary too, you know, they're, yeah. when you use he or she, even then you kind of leave them out sometimes. Yeah. I always do this thing. Like if I don't know what their gender is or their pronoun, I go with they and them just to be on the safe side. Cause the last thing I want to do is like, you know, not respect someone. So I guess what you're saying, you know, I try my best to practice that as well. Yeah, I definitely think that's one, one of the things we, I know you practice and I think as a whole, we just need to be more, you know, welcoming to other people in the industry. And you have some experience with that when you first started got in, yeah. first started getting into security. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's weird. It's kind of, it's one of those things that, you know, being a woman in this space in my first year, it was the reason that made me want to leave, but it was also the reason that made me want to stay. And I know that sounds really weird, but it was, I honestly was planning to leave the industry within the first year. I never could. It was weird. I never thought that I would be working in an industry, which it felt like I was working in the 1940s of how, you know, women were being treated around me, including myself in the industry in the first year that I, I got in. But then at the same time, I went to a conference when I did decide to quit <laughs> the industry, but I, I got tied back into it because I went to this one conference. It was called Day of Security. And it was in San Francisco. It was like June back in 2018. I think it was 2018. Um, but when I was there, I was suddenly in a room full of people that were, you know, you have marginalized genders in there and you have, and it just, I finally felt like, oh my God, I don't feel alone anymore. And I think that was the changing moment where I realized, okay, I'm going to stay in this space because I deserve to be in this space. And so do all these other people deserve to be in this space. So how can I be an ally for, you know, all these other people that are feeling that, you know, they're being pushed out or not being welcomed enough. And that's all I do is always ask the question, how do I make this better? How can I be better at this? How can I explore this with someone else? I think that's what being an ally is all about. It's just asking the questions, how, why, and, and what all the time. Good, good points. And I think to, to me, you know, you kind of mentioned the manager writing the job description and maybe not intending to be exclusive, exclude others. But another thing we have to think about too, one of the things I know from my experience and one of the things I've done, I think people need to always make sure you're always evolving your thinking and looking at what's going on in the world around you just because it's changed and different don't mean it was okay before people are just kind of waking up and, and seeing that we need to treat people better. But I think a lot of cases, some people like myself, I was never trying to exclude anyone. I had a lot of friends, different, you know, uh, male, female, non-binary and uh, different races always had them as friends. But one of the things you have to think about is when, you know, trying to be an ally, you need to try to help others out. I mean, it seems like, you know, just when you start thinking about trying to help the others that, that you can make an impact and hopefully others will, will kind of catch on. Yeah. I think it's needed more than ever before right now. I think our, our whole world has been shifted and, and split in many ways, I think politically in the U S and so it's really important for us to be aware of that, you know, all the movements that occurred before the pandemic and during the pandemic, those are still occurring to this day. They haven't just disappeared because it's no longer a thing that's trending on social media. It's still very much needed for us to still keep learning and to keep driving change because it hasn't been fixed. None of it has been fixed at this time. So that's just letting us know we still have to keep our, you know, rolling up our sleeves and doing the best that we can um, to become Honestly, it's really looking at yourself in the mirror to see how do you become a better person? And then also, how do you become a better ally? And just ask yourself questions and really be okay with the uncomfortable because it's when we have discomfort that we learn new things about ourselves and our environments. Yeah, I think people need to, can you know, 
walk a mile in the other person's shoes and just kind of see what they're going through and think about that. I mean, you know, it's, you feel so much better when you're able to help people than when you just ignore it and just let things go on. I mean, you don't have to put, you know, yourself at risks or anything by doing that. I mean, you're just helping people. Some people kind of worry about, you know, reputation or whatever, but if you're doing the right thing, then you're, you're, you, you know, you, at the end of the day, you can feel good about it. And it's, and I think sometimes we surround ourselves around people that maybe because, you know, cause typically, you know, some cases women will hang around women, men hang around with men, whatever your demographic is, the people you relate to is who you hang around with. But I think you just really need to make sure to expand that circle and then think about the people outside of that, that you, you normally uh, hang out with that you do try to help out. Yeah, exactly. There's, I think that's how it is, right? Is that we need to mix with each other. We need to, you know, network with each other. We need to understand one another. And how can you do that if you don't ever socialize with a different side? I think that's really important. It's just for us to learn about each other and to shape our own beliefs, but also to correct our own beliefs or also to just get to know one another and understand, yeah, we all have our own opinions and that's okay. As long as it's not hurting anyone, there's no harm in it, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing sometimes when you just reach out to someone else and they feel accepted how much big of a difference you make. It's kind of crazy. Some of the things that I've seen, because I was even not even aware of what was going on that day. I was at a, at a restaurant eating lunch one day and I ran into to a young black man that was in the, the restaurant and we just got started talking. He was sitting diagonally across from me. Uh, he needed something the waitress didn't see him and I flagged her down. And so she went back, got what he needed. And we just kind of had this little dialogue. You know, he was a former football player, just graduated, just finished his last year of football at, I think, Oklahoma State University, OSU or something like that. And we're just talking and having a good conversation. One thing I, I do a lot is when I'm out in public, I just like striking up conversations because it makes things more interesting. But at the end of the conversation, several times he thanked me for talking to him that it helped him feel better. And I wasn't really clicking and understanding. And, you know, he's a recent college grad. And sometimes I like to buy people's meals or they're in a grocery store or something. I'll buy their stuff just to do something nice. And I bought his lunch. We talked again. And then we're leaving. He said, thanks again. I appreciate the, the talk. This was very helpful. I get in my car, turn on the radio, and the Charlottesville stuff's going on. So whenever they see that someone is not like them, that's inflicting the pain that that demographic likes them too and, and supports them and accepts them that it's, they realize it's not the whole world that's that way. And, and people need a little hope. I think right now the world could really use a lot of hope. I think from the yes. pandemic, it's insane how things are now since the pandemic, you can like, you can tell if people got therapy or did something that was therapeutic during the time. And then those that didn't work on themselves and didn't even take the time um, during the pandemic. And you can see the differences of people's behaviors. Like, uh, and it's, it's, it's one of those things I remember when I was talking to Ryan Louie, who we both know, and for those that aren't aware, he's a psychiatrist who got into cybersecurity, but mostly to focus on the issues of mental health of security folks and we were talking about the concerns that this pandemic is going to show us later on down the road if we don't work on ourselves and everything that he shared with me i've been noticing are completely coming true we have more people that are, are anxious more people that are burned out more people that are depressed than you know before the pandemic in our industry which is crazy because i think even before we were talking about how burnout was a problem, but it was continually dismissed over and over again. But now we notice that during the pandemic, burnout was something that was incredibly common. And even to this day, we're all wondering, why are we so exhausted all the time? Well, we just went through like a world changing event and we haven't had a break or a pause. There has been no healing from this. So of course we're gonna be exhausted, but so important is to keep yourself in check. And yeah, and I, I don't know where I was going with that tangent. I'm gonna be honest, Phil. But <laughs> those are my thoughts about mental health now. Apparently. <laughs> yeah, but one one of the things too, like you said, you know, because I know you do some good talks on on burnout, 
And one of the things that we saw even before the pandemic, there were a lot of people that were going through burnout because, you know, security can be a stressful job and, you know, people are shorthanded. There's not enough people on staff to do the job. And so you throw the pandemic on top of that. Yeah. I mean, Phil, remember I was running like three nonprofits and then two full-time jobs at the same time. Yeah. For like a couple of years. And I was like, I'm fine. Totally fine. Then saying like, boom, I have no energy. I don't want to be on social media. I need to, I need (laughs) to go into a cave and sleep for like, I don't know how long and just be a bear. No pun intended. (laughs) 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 So what would be some of your recommendations for people to kind of help with burnout, to avoid burnout or try to heal from, oh, from burnout? So I would say the, the biggest lesson I learned about burnout is that burnout can also come if you don't treat it, if you don't make any treatments of it whatsoever, you can develop like depression, anxiety, or both. And that's one of the things that I highly recommend if people already are starting to feel you know exhausted or they feel stuck they feel like they they're constantly worried or like i would say like say you have two weeks and more than half of that week you're always in a state of worry at different times or you can be feeling like you just don't want to get out of bed you have you've lost pleasure in doing things you just have no energy i think these are all signs that maybe it may be a good idea to start seeing a therapist I think the one thing that we have to understand is that seeing a therapist is not taboo. I guarantee you it is a popular thing now. It is trendy. Okay, people, it's trendy to go see a therapist. So go see a therapist. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, But you have to know and learn how to be attuned with yourself. And that's what a therapist is supposed to help you do is to help you feel strong internally to be able to understand what's going on and how the external is impacting you. And so I recommend therapy number one, if you're feeling any of that. I would say the second thing is make sure you get good sleep. Um, Believe it or not, we should all get good sleep. If we don't get good sleep, yeah, that's definitely going to hinder our mental health happiness. Um, The other thing is to write. Um, So I have, I'll write in a journal If I need to do like a long journal entry, I'll put in something like a book like this. But if I'm in that point where I can't really write a whole page, I don't have time. There's this really awesome thing called the five minute journal. You can see it. (laughs) So the five minute journal is really cool. So I can show you. So the inside is like this. So you do it in the morning and then you do it in the evening before you go to bed. And so I will do this when I need to. And it has a really fun quote at the top. And then you start your day by doing this entry. And it takes you like maybe two minutes. And then the last bit takes two minutes. So it really does take five minutes a day. You really don't have, you know, you can't push it away saying that takes too much of your time. And I think this this is the thing that has helped me a lot um, to help me be on track. And also it starts your day really well. There's like this thing about when you are grateful for things first thing in the morning, it kind of starts off your day very well. And one of the things I've also learned is to not check the news or social media first thing when you wake up. <laughs> um, that will just, you know, that's not going to start your day off, right? You you own the time that you have and time is so limited. So when you wake up in the morning, take your five minute journal, get your cup of coffee, your tea. Don't look at your phone yet and be there for yourself, do something that you care about, some sort of morning ritual. And then when you are ready to start your day, in a sense, then you can pick up your phone and do whatever you need to, including social media and Reddit. Hello, Redditors out there. (laughs) But yeah, I would say those are the best tricks is that, and also make sure you don't drink or smoke too much. That's, that's going to deplete you from energy and it's going to fail you in the long run if you do a lot of that, be honest. Great advice. So what are the, some of the, you, you know, I know you speak at a lot of conferences for those that, that don't know you. Chloe has a very busy speaking schedule. So uh, recently you've come up with so, some new talks mm-hmm. that you're presenting at conferences, if you wouldn't mind uh, yeah. sharing about those. Absolutely. Um, So um, I, let's see here. So during the pandemic, 
one of the things I wanted to do was constantly keep learning. I read like all the time. I'm an avid reader. And one of the things that really piqued my interest was about sustainability. So such as climate change. And the thing that I started thinking about and wanting to research was how is that going to impact our industry? Because we don't talk about it. Like we don't talk about it at all. I always think of, you know, Encanto, you know, the song, we don't talk about Bruno that every mm -hmm. parent dreads to hear now. Think about that song. We don't, we don't talk about Bruno. No, no. Think of, we don't talk about climate change. No, no, no. In our industry, <laughs> because it always goes through my head. Um, but that, that is the scary reality in, you know, climate change is not going away. It's not a fake thing. It's very much real. And we're seeing it happen and unfold. And, you know, this research just came out a couple, like a couple weeks ago that shared that we we're going to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer within the next few years. That is way sooner than we all thought. And that scares that that's really scary because what we're really doing by not talking about it, not taking action fast enough is that we are saying ourselves, our societies, the, and all the things that live and breathe on this planet, we are setting them up to fail. And so we have to do something about it. But then also you have to think about it is that whenever there is disasters that are occurring, who makes a lot of money from it? And that's usually attackers. Those are usually malicious actors. And that's the thing we have to consider is that, you know, whenever there's a disaster, we may see a tick of, you know, incredibly more of a higher wave of threat actors trying to penetrate systems or to cause real harm. And so I think it's important for us to start talking about it and understand that our industry needs to talk about it because we're the only industry that isn't talking about it in the first place now at this point. So as a risk management person, I think it's very risky for us to just ignore the elephant in the room, which is climate change, because that's going to happen. So that's one talk that I started giving this year. I started giving a little previews of it last year, but now, now it's more acceptive, I would say. And it's really interesting the questions you get afterwards of these talks, because it's too many people, they think it's controversial which I find interesting because how is it controversial if it's a fact, you know, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one. Um, I think the other talks I tend to do is a lot on security team wellness. So how can CISOs be better leaders? Also, how do we support our CISOs? What do CISOs need from the board, from the, the executive suite? What do they need to be successful? at this time. And I think that's the thing we all have to come together and understand is that we're kind of all in this together. And if we don't act, and if we don't get other people to act with us, you know, be our advocates in different departments and in different industries, um, we're going to continue to burn out. And we're going to keep like basically losing people from our industry because they can't deal with it anymore. And so we need to support them. And so I give talks about how do we support one another when it comes to security team wellness, making sure our team feels supported and heard. But also, you know, I always think of uh, the Ted Lasso series. And I think that we can, if we could have more CISOs and managers that are kind of like a Ted Lasso, I think our industry would, doing, would be so much healthier that we'd be able to retain people and be able to recruit people faster than ever before. Very interesting. So we're getting down towards the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close out the episode? Um, I would just say everyone be kind to one another and thank you for existing. And if you ever have any questions or you need support or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, on social media, my DMs are open, I'm more than happy to help out, just like Phil is. And I don't know if Phil tells people this all the time, but he, sh you know, honestly, Phil is also his DMs are always open and a good, you know, yep. source of figuring out what to do next or looking for resources. He's a good start too, um, because he can point you to the right people as well. Thanks for the, for that. Uh, and we'll be sharing Chloe's uh, 
social media and links to her website in the show notes. So you won't have to worry about trying to do your OSINT to find that. <laughs> I dare you. It's already there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Chloe OSINT challenge. Yeah. To... <laughs> oh dear. What did I just sign up for? <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah, good luck, the- people. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for joining. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Oh, thanks for having me. And I look forward to the next time I see you. And I hope that, you know, you wrestle a bear at some point, or we're gonna get <laughs> someone in a costume of a bear and then you can wrestle that person. Yeah, we kind of did a reenactment of that Wild West Hacking Fest last year. See, now you have to just do it at DEF CON. I, so I can be there to watch. <laughs> Funny. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the next Thank episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.